might have come from somewhere else But this is where we found ourselves Welcome to the local show People you work with, people you know Welcome to another edition of The Local Show here on Grassroots Community Network. Welcome to our Facebook and YouTube audience. Thanks for joining us, guys. We're each week here on Grassroots TV. We feature inspirational locals. I'm so excited to offer you another first-time guest, guys. He is an innovator, a pioneer, an entrepreneur, a developer, a cyclist, most importantly. Welcoming to the show, Robbie Levin. Welcome to the show, Robbie. Thanks, Eric. And we've got Luna in the house, buddy, because... I understand you're a dog lover too. Yep, we got our, our Pomsky. <laughs> there you go. You got it's our mandatory local show fixture, kind of like we have the leather couch, the table, the retro mic now, and the dog. So thanks for taking your time and your valuable time to join us today. No, yeah, my pleasure. So uh, there's so many things we can t we talk about, but we want to talk about more of the focus on your love for cycling, your involvement with spinning. So I want to kind of go back to the early days of biking, because I know when I was like learning how to ride a bike in those first early years, I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We were just like kids bombing around the neighborhood on our bikes, and that was really the kind of the feeling of like joy and freedom. And um, first of all, where were you born and raised, and kind of what were your first experiences with riding a bike? I grew up in, uh, I was born and grew up in San Jose, okay. uh, pre-Silicon Valley. Okay. It, it wasn't called Silicon Valley back then. It was, a <laughs> uh, it was a lot of orchards, and, you know, I walked to school through a cherry orchard, and it was, wow. it was a pretty, pretty open, uh, non-developed area. But the, the population was still, you know, well over 100,000 people back then. Okay. But it was spread out, and um, there was lots of great places to, to cycle in the mountains, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I was about uh, 16 miles from Santa Cruz, Nice. So um, I got my first uh, actual race bike, which was an Italia 10-speed, campy components, um, uh, aluminum magnesium wheels. It was considered to be a super light bike at that time. And I bought it at Kmart for $70. I'll never forget because I had to save the money. <laughs> and it was $70. And it was, you know, most people were riding uh, either Raleigh's or Schwinn's exactly. or Clubman's. Those were the big, big bikes. Maybe a Huffy. Were yeah, those this is pre-Huffy. Pre-Huffy, yeah. It's kind of like Schwinn back yeah, in that time. Yeah, Schwinn was big. Yeah. Um, and I saw this <laughs> Italian bike, and the name was Italia, and wow. I, just, I just had to have it. So I bought this bike. and How uh, old were you at that point? 12. 12. I was 12 years old. <laughs> and this bike weighed 26 pounds, which at the time was really light. You wow. know, steel frame. Um, and, uh, you know, we started, I just started riding and we just started riding and I had a group of like three or four guys and we used to ride and on the weekends we'd go out into the Santa Cruz mountains and we'd ride around Saratoga and Palo Alto and Santa Cruz in, in those mountains. And we were pretty much untouched. There were no cyclists back then and we didn't have cycling clothes. So we were either in shorts or we were in long pants with, with the clips on the pants so they didn't get caught in the right, chain ring. Right, right. And uh, wow. we would ride in, in all weather. And we had a little rack on the back. And uh, this is kind of, uh, you know, back then it was, uh, you know, it was wool cycling jerseys and wool cycling shorts. There was no spandex back then. That's right. But we would go out on Saturdays. We'd do 50, 60 miles on a Saturday. Road in the, rides. In the mountains. On the roads. Yeah, on the roads. The mountainous roads. Those yeah, are big oh, rides. Yeah, all mountainous roads. And we were crazy. I mean, <laughs> there, there was this one space between uh, Saratoga and Las Gatas where, where, where there was this big hill. It was probably, I'm going to say it was 6 7% grade. And big trucks would go back and forth. And we would catch these trucks right at the top of the crest. And then we'd follow them over the crest and we'd be doing 60 miles an hour behind the 12 you years old. You remind me of the scene from Breaking Away right, right. now. <laughs> and we'd be behind these trucks, 60 miles an hour, our eyes glued on the brake lights. Amazing. Just wailing down. And wow. we, didn't, we didn't know any better. And there, was, there were times when we would be in the mountains. Like we would, one of our favorite places to go was a place called um, Big Basin, 
which was in the, in, Sa in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And okay. we would, we would uh, go for three or four days at a time uh, in the summer. And one of my best buddies that I rode with, his parents didn't know my parents. So I would tell my parents that I was going for four, on a four-day trip with him and his parents, and he would do the same. <laughs> and, the t and we would pack sleeping bags on our little racks, oh on our 10-speeds, and we would go to the parks where people were camping, and we would tool around in the parks for four days. And we'd, meet, we'd wow. always meet young girls, and they, they would be with their parents, and so they'd invite us to come and eat with them, and we would just mooch Amazing. off of families <laughs> and ride around in our bikes. And so we were crazy. We like used bike to put in, touring, way before bike touring yeah, was big, even a thing. Yeah, big miles back then. Amazing. And then it was uh, probably around the time um, that I was playing rock and roll uh, after that, and it was probably around the time that I moved to Los Angeles, and I started riding in the Santa Monica Mountains. Okay. And I, I kept cycling during this whole period. And I got into martial okay. arts, and I, I trained in martial arts for 13 years and just kept riding my bike wow. as kind of cross-training. Um, and it was, you know, they were similar. I mean, there's, they're so leg-oriented. Both of those sports right. are very leg-oriented. So the martial arts helped my cycling, and the cycling helped my martial arts. And, um, and I lived uh, about, for about 13 years, I lived uh, five miles from Pepperdine University on Malibu Canyon Road, just off Malibu Canyon Road. And the cycling there in Los Angeles, it was amazing. It's like back a hotbed. And nobody was cycling then, really. It was a, it was a more of an esoteric sport. This okay. is um, this is pre Le Monde. Okay. Right. Right. I mean, right. You know, uh, so uh, it wasn't that big in the United States, and by that time we were riding pretty sophisticated bikes at that time. Right, right. And, and the bikes were getting better. Um, I was riding uh, an Eddie Merckx. You know, he, he, when he was racing, he was racing on DeRosa. And then DeRosa, he went in with DeRosa, and DeRosa made the Eddie Merckx bike at the beginning. Okay. So now okay. Eddie Merckx is, you know, it's his own company. But at the beginning, DeRosa was making his steel frame bikes. Okay. And then in night, and, and, and I had met Johnny G in 1981. Okay. I was introduced to him because he was doing triathlons, and I was cycling. And uh, I'm, I'm not just sure. I think it was 81 that we met. Okay, let's just let's take a quick break because we're going to take our, our only break of the show. I do need to acknowledge my underwriters, and we're going to when we come back, you guys, we're going to learn about Robbie's story with Johnny G, the start of spinning, and so much we got to get to. But like I say, we're want to thank our summer underwriters, including Aspen Square, CMC Aspen, Klug Properties, Live Aspen Art, White River Overland, Pickin County Landfill, and Sundog Athletics. We'll go to our only break, guys. We're going to be back, and we're going to set the record straight on who really started spinning, you guys, and so much more, especially for you bike geeks, so don't go away. White River Overland specializes in camper van upfitting and overland outfitting. Catering to mountain dwellers and outdoor enthusiasts, many of WRO's builds are purpose-driven to facilitate and enhance skiing, cycling, camping, climbing, and river adventures. Nestled in the White River National Forest, close to the deserts of western Colorado and Utah, WRO also rents camper vans and accessories. More at whiteriveroverland.com. CMC is preparing the people who make Aspen work. CMC Aspen collaborates with the community, providing skilled workers, future leaders, and problem solvers, meeting our economy's needs, ensuring opportunity, and workforce integrity for generations to come. I'm so passionate about this community. I absolutely love living here and raising my family here. 
It gives me a lot of pride to share this with my friends and my clients and help them achieve their, their dreams of owning an Aspen Snowmass and enjoying this incredible lifestyle. Live Aspen Art is a working studio at the base of Aspen Highlands. Come meet the artists and view both finished pieces and works in progress by owner Olivia Dane and visiting artists, or take private art classes offered for kids and adults. Olivia's recent works are also on view at Opera Gallery at the base of Aspen Mountain. For more information, contact Olivia at 970-379-2539 for an appointment, or visit liveaspenartgallery.com. Welcome to We're back here on the local show. Thanks for sticking with us, guys. We got Robbie Levin on the show. Again, he, this guy's, I think you've had four or five careers, it sounds like, Robbie. You've had your three, like your three big ones. Three big ones. You had your cycling, and you still are an avid cyclist. Uh, clothing, you were in the clothing industry, which was your main business for many years. 18 years, yeah. 18 years. Um, you've been involved in development. Let's just touch on that really quick. Sorrel Ranch. Just outside of Moab. Sorrel River Ranch, yeah. Sor Sorrel River Ranch. Tell us just a little bit about that. Well, after I had my clothing business in Los Angeles, and uh, I sold it at the end of 86, had a management contract till the end of 91. The end of 91, I moved to Utah, moved to Deer Valley, where okay. I'd, I'd had property since 79, but I wanted to relocate there. And I wanted to build a resort. So I started looking for property. Uh, for one reason or another, I was in escrow on three pieces of property, two up in Park City, one down in St. George, and for crazy reasons, they would fall out of escrow. Like, one, the guy died while we were in escrow. Oh, okay. when It went into probate. But I finally ended up looking at land in Moab, which at the time was becoming the mountain biking, you know, hub of the, of the world, mecca of the world. <laughs> right. Fell in love with Moab and found a piece of property on the Colorado River, 240-acre historic ranch that had been settled in 1903. There was nothing there but about 100 cows and some barbed wire fence, a couple of old <laughs> historic buildings. And uh, I went through the process with uh, Grand County, Utah, to get the entitlements to build a resort. And they loved it, so I built the resort there. It was a 15-year project. And I, wow. I built the whole thing myself. I was a GC and the architect on the whole project. And Amazing. Uh, and uh, then I ran the resort uh, for eight years. Took me, took me a while to get it open because I had to develop the whole land, you know, all the land, put the infrastructure in, build all the buildings. But uh, the resort went, was great, really phenomenal piece of property. And uh, I still have a lot there, and I still go and visit. And, and uh, the new owner's a good friend, and so anytime I want to go, I have a room and still go and, uh, you know, do some road riding up in the LaSalle Mountains. That's incredible. I've had the pleasure of staying there. And then you sold that in 2008, is yep. that correct? 2008. I stayed there, uh, yeah, it would have been about 2014, I think, uh, for a friend's wedding. We had an amazing weekend, yeah. really beautiful. So congratulations on that. What a, what a beautiful uh, resort and property. I mean, the area, it is just, you know, it's it's one of the most beautiful places in the United States. Yeah, it was a great it's Castle great, Valley, basically. Great project. Yeah, just on the other side of Castle Valley. Right. right. Yeah. Well, let's, let's shift gears back into cycling. And um, we were talking about kind of cycling in the early uh, years, early 80s. Uh, you're meeting Johnny G in 1981, correct? Uh -huh. 81. And he was he was racing bikes. And well, he was can, doing triathlons at the triathlons, time. Triathlons, okay. He was a he was a trainer, a personal trainer. Okay. So he was training a lot of people in Hollywood, and uh, we met. We we had a lot in common, you know. So um, we did some road riding together, and we trained together, and um, just kind of developed a, a relationship. And then uh, around. 86 he started getting into ultramarathon cycling so we started training together i started doing a little more miles because the ultramarathon cycling regime the training regime is is a little bit a little bit more miles than than road racing you know right. you're you're pushing the envelope a little bit more especially right. especially on a on a semi amateur l level more longer rides yeah longer rides yeah. longer like all rides days, 6 8 hour rides yeah less of. less intense as far as the yeah. Um, you know, as far as your, how long you hold your anaerobic threshold, your maximum heart rate. Um, and uh, so we, 
uh, trained for Ram 87. I was kind of his training partner. And uh, in 1987, before we did Ram, uh, it was actually February 1st, we were on a pretty standard training ride. It was just a 100-mile ride. We would a lot of time do, do a double on Saturday, do 100 on Sunday, and then do a couple more centuries during the week. So this is 500 miles a week is what I was doing. He, wow. When he was training for the race, he was pushing it up to over 1,000, 1,100 miles a week. Wow. Um, but I was still working in my, with my clothing company. So, you know, I mean, I'd go out and do 100 miles between <laughs> 6 and 11 and then go home and shower and get to work at noon. And then I'd be, <laughs> able, to go to be work. at work all day. You know? <laughs> That's a massive so, day. So we were on a training ride in, in 1987, February 1st. I went down in some gravel. And it wasn't a real bad fall. I mean, we were going around a turn. We were talking. Wasn't paying much attention. There was a bunch of pea gravel in the road. Uh -oh. And I just went down on my hip and uh, fractured my hip. I got an 85% spiral fracture in the head of my femur. And uh, they put um, two steel pins in the head of my femur to hold it together. And the heads of the pins were still sticking out because the doctor said they'll probably be in there for 10 months to a year and then we're going to take the pins out. Because wow. it was a pretty clean spiral fracture. So he said, but you, you don't want to go on the road. He said, because those heads are still sticking out. You fall on those heads, you're going to really damage your bone. Right. So. Um, I had stationary huh. bike at home and, you know, for when it was raining or something like that. And I started doing three to five hours a day on the stationary bike uh, to recover from my, my broken hip. So the big craze at the time was aerobics. That's what was really going on. You know, right. Jane Fonda Jane out. Jane Fonda, step aerobics, and it, aerobicize and all that stuff. Right. So, you know, being a musician for, professional musician for 15 years, it was easy for me to stay stimulated with music. And I would create these tapes to listen to while I was riding. And I had quite a few tapes because I was riding so many hours a day on the stationary. And while I'm doing this, I'm thinking, what about an aerobics class on stationary bikes? And that's where the idea for spinning came up. So I, I, um, I kind of made some more tapes. And then around, be around um, by, I'd say, around April or May of that year, I had just bought a new house. And the house had this really cool workout room that I was using as a martial arts studio. It had wood floor and mirrors in it. I took all the equipment out, bought 12 Schwinn DX900 stationary bikes, uh -huh. which are just like the current spinning bikes. It's just they, had, they didn't have a drop bar, handlebar, or anything. Right. Put them in a big circle. And Johnny and I, because Johnny was, was still training for RAM, which is the race across America. Race across America for, for 1987. Yeah. And we would, I would program the music. We'd give everybody heart rate monitors because at the time, heart rate monitors were just coming in and we were doing zone training. Right. And this was early. Nobody was really using heart rate monitors. This was in cutting 86. edge. It was very cutting edge. CIC, which became Polar, was the company that first made the first heart rate monitors. Right. So we would be kind of in the center on a little stage, just like a regular spinning class, and we would do exactly what we would do spinning classes. And we had all these people coming into the spinning classes, and then we did RAM in August of 87. And while we're doing RAM, I was thinking, you know, we should do, we should copyright this and do a actual video on it. So we got back from Ram 87. Johnny dropped out about 2,200 miles. I think it was Indiana. He dropped out. He was really hurting. And it's, that's kind of a race that a lot of people drop out in. It's not unusual to drop yeah. out. Yeah, I think most um, people But we out. came back, and uh, I wrote a script for this thing. And we did this video, which uh, is on YouTube right now from 1987. Uh, it says right at the beginning of the video, copyright. Robert Levin, Johnny Goldberg, and um, that was the official spinning kind of video thing. So then uh, what we, were, we continued to do classes at my house, and, and Johnny was actually, at this point, living at my house. I had two bedrooms for him, one for him and one for his kids when they came, because I had a really large house in Malibu Valley. <laughs> so 
um, while we're doing classes, he says, I, I want to finish the race. I want to do it again. So he had to requalify. So I said, if you want to do it again, because in 87, I was the sponsor. I sponsored the race. Okay. And so in 88, I said, I'll, I'll sponsor the qualifier and I'll sponsor Ram 89 if you want to. But this time, we, it'll be our second time doing it. We really know how to do it. So um, we did the John Marino Open. Johnny did phenomenal in the Open. Very strong cyclist, really strong cyclist. And qualified, uh, pro I think he set a world record for that qualifier in Arizona. Um, and I think it's Tucson, Flagstaff, and back, 500-mile qualifier. Amazing. No stops. You just do the whole 500 wow. miles. So you, you could know. qualify for the race yeah. across America right. so he could and, do it again. And then in 89, I did it really right. I put together massive crew, two crews, spent about 150 grand on the race. And, uh, and he didn't want it. He, around 23, 2400 miles, he was ready to drop out again. He, did, he, he was just beat up. Huh. And he was going to drop out, and he was, there was nothing physically wrong with him. In 87, he was hurting physically, his knee, his neck, and he had really bad saddle sores, which is the, the two biggest problems in RAM if you're doing it solo, not as a team RAM, because back then it was only solo riders. It's either neck or saddle sores. Yeah. Those are two of the worst things. That makes sense. But we knew about that. We had two chiropractors on the crew two massage therapists on the crew, an acupuncturist on the crew. <laughs> and every time he would get off the bike for even five minutes, he would be hand carried into one of the motor homes because we had two motor homes. We would shower him in like two minutes, change his clothes, fresh, fresh shorts. So he never got a saddle sore because the saddle sore comes from bacteria buildup. These guys are on the bikes for so many hours. Yeah. Yeah. So it was around 2,400 miles. He wanted to drop out. And I, I said to him, because uh, I was in the chase vehicle all the time. I actually slept less than he did on a Ram. I think he got 14 hours and nine days, and I got <laughs> 10 hours and nine days. <laughs> so I said, Johnny, if you want to drop out, it's fine. No problem. You know, nobody's going to hold it against you. But I just want you to think about one thing. Just think about two or three months from now when you're not in any pain, you're not as tired as you are right now, and all of your sports friends come up to you and say, Oh, so you didn't finish again, huh? And this thing went off in his head because that ego that a lot of professional cyclists and a lot of professional athletes have that ego specifically about their sport, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that really hit him. And he got back on his bike and he finished the race in 89. So, um, so then after the race... Uh, things were not real good after the race. We, we'd been friends for eight, nine, almost nine years, but some weird things happened, which were not necessary to really go into, and we kind of just went our separate way. And I finished my contract with my clothing company in 91, the end of 91. I moved to Utah, and around, I think it was 97, I'm building the resort in Moab, and I see this People magazine article. And I had heard some rumblings about spinning, but I wasn't paying attention to what was going on. Huh. And I see this article in People Magazine where because spinning had gotten so big by 97. Right, right. So he's in People. And it, right there in People Magazine, he says that he created spinning in 1987 after Race Across America. I mean, 1989. Sorry, 1989 after Race Across America. And I was like... What? And you guys had start, started these informal classes in 87, two years earlier. And shot the video in 87. We, we're already down to just a couple minutes, and I want to see this trailer. So um, there is a documentary coming up with the, with the true story when we set the record straight about spinning, how it was created. And uh, actually, let's just check this video real yeah, quick, Robbie, and we'll be right back. In 1995, Johnny G released this video of how he created spinning in 1989. <laughs> Principles that worked for me, that made me successful, could work for anybody. Once I realized this, I formulated a training program, formulated training principles, and created a program called Spinning. In 1987, Robbie Levin produced the first spinning video and spinning program. I came up with this idea, and Johnny and I put together classes at my house. 
We, everybody got heart rate monitors. I did all the music programming. We, uh, Johnny and I would be in the middle of the class, uh, kind of on a little riser. And that was how spinning got started. In 1987, around, I think it was just after Ram. He clicked on this idea of having a bike but, and spinning where it's more of an organized workout. Create an exercise class that was a lot like the aerobics classes that were out at the time. We made a video. We made the first spinning video. The concept of promoting and, uh, and giving credibility to developing spinning. I remember one time you said we're going to copyright this because that was kind of the next step. And this is after maybe a year and a half of practice. Mostly my friends were in the video, my son and people that I worked with and old musicians and a, a bike racer that I had trained with from Denmark. So Robbie, people will see a full documentary movie in the next three to six months? It, it's a documentary short. It's not a okay. full length, but it's a short. Yeah, in the next three to six months, it should be out on uh, some version of social media at least, at very least. Okay. Now my last closing question, maybe the most important, did you guys, were those mullets you had in that video? Because I mean, I almost got one now. <laughs> I call it COVID head. A little bit short in front, a little bit long in back. And you, were, you guys were so rocking that, that 80s style. That's the only proof that it was the 80s. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You had like metal toe clips and uh, yeah, <laughs> if that's anything, right. that's and right. the long 80s hair. That's right, yeah. Did you have fun on the show today? Oh, yeah, it's great. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for being so humble about it. I'd imagine it's not about money. No, absolutely <laughs> it's not. It's about just setting the record straight, that's right? That's right. Getting that's the truth out about. there. That's what the video is all about. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks yeah. for joining us. Next time, we, next time we have you on the show, we'll talk about your rock and roll career, which is equally as impressive. So I got uh, parting gifts. I baked you some cookies, buddy. Well, thank you. And a little squishy cup, That's groovy great. squishy, we call them, from Pitkin County Landfill. Thank you. And thanks so much for joining us on thanks. the show. Robbie Levin, Luna, our mascot. And above all, thank you guys for watching The Local Show. White River Overland specializes in camper van upfitting and overland outfitting. Catering to mountain dwellers and outdoor enthusiasts, many of WRO's builds are purpose-driven to facilitate and enhance skiing, cycling, camping, climbing, and river adventures. Nestled in the White River National Forest, close to the deserts of western Colorado and Utah, WRO also rents camper vans and accessories. More at whiteriveroverland.com. Celebrating another great summer season by offering up to 25% off their nightly rates. Aspen Square Hotel is the hospitality place featuring fireplace studio suites and larger condominiums with full hotel style services in the center of downtown Aspen. Aspen Square is proud to support the local show. Sundog Athletics, Aspen's adventure sports school, is your opportunity to experience one-of-a-kind guided adventures and gain new skills to experience the thrills of mountain and road biking, fitness hiking, and Aspen's exclusive canoeing adventure. They can be reached at 970-925-1069, and fresh updates can be found at Sundog Athletics on Facebook or sundogathletics.com. Welcome to...